Uh, for me, it's, uh, some, it's the principles around human rights and trying to understand people and what current social and health issues affect us as people. And really, how do we make things work? In terms of accountability, I think I'm accountable to the people I work with. And that includes people who use drugs, researchers, and service providers. In terms of decriminalization, I conduct work locally in South Africa, and I try and do relevant research that is largely linked to service delivery, and in whatever way possible to try and get that to inform our own policy and to use it for advocacy. So that's my answer to the three questions. So I'm not talking solely about new initiatives, but I think I'm going to use the liberty to give a bit of background to drug use and particularly injecting drug use in South Africa before I hand over to, to David and, and Mariette. Just as a reminder, we have a, a package of interventions recommended by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, the World Health Organization, the Joint United Nations uh, um, Program on HIV and AIDS, and the Global Fund, and there's irrefutable evidence of the effectiveness of this comprehensive package to prevent HIV, hepatitis, and to avoid death. So really there's no evidence-based reason why these things aren't put in place. The reasons for them not being implemented are not evidence-related. However, few places are actually implementing the full package. So it includes needle and syringe programs, opioid use substitution therapy, HIV testing and treatment, antiretroviral therapy, prevention and treatment of STIs, tuberculosis, viral hepatitis, targeted information, relevant information, as well as prevention and uh, treatment of hepatitis I mentioned, and overdose prevention importantly. So in terms of South Africa, we don't have a lot of information around people who inject drugs. I was fortunate enough to be involved in the first quantitative assessment of people who inject drugs in three South African cities. And I remember very well in these three cities being Cape Town, Durban, and Pretoria, people saying that actually there aren't a lot of, peop a lot of people who inject drugs in these cities. Nevertheless, we managed to do the research and find people who inject drugs with really high risk taking practices. One in two people were sharing or reusing needles. Um, over 90% of them had been arrested and about 70% of them had been in the prison system. Since then, that has enabled a lot of service delivery, which is so great to see Nelson and others talk about the great work that's happening. And that was part of the start of this work. We don't have great population size estimates, but this is part of a report which was shown earlier, I think, by Olga. And it's part of a great report done by UNA. It's called Do No Harm. And this is a snapshot of what's happening in South Africa. And I've just added on the hepatitis data, which is current and it's interim and it's related to a study that I'm working with in collaboration with a whole lot of people. Again, people didn't think viral hepatitis was an issue in South Africa, but we found hepatitis prevalence of 55% across the three cities that we, that we were recruiting and up to 75% in Chwane. So it's really important that the city of Chwane invests in the comprehensive package. So of the people who inject drugs in South Africa, we estimate there are about 75,000 but that's only a small portion uh, of people who use drugs more globally, in the, in the country at least. And Yorpe and Wunga are the things that are most important in people's mind, but I keep reminding people that it, those include heroin, and a proportion of people who use heroin will proceed to inject. So even at the moment, it is only 75,000. If we don't get things right and provide services for those people, we're gonna have a much bigger problem. And already we know that 14% of those are living with HIV, and in some cities where no work was done, so a colleague from Anova has just started the first needle syringe program in Johannesburg, and they're finding much higher rates of that. Even though they've only recruited a few number of people, they're finding prevalence, uh, at least a positivity of upwards of 60%. So we have an issue, and we need to act. So I was also fortunate enough this week to lead a training around a new guide that's been developed by the United Nations of, of, of us, Office of Drugs and Crime in collaboration with INPUD, which is the international network of people who use drugs. And this is a really great tool. It's very accessible, it's very user-friendly, and it's free access. And what it does is it collates all of the available information and tools and the evidence for the comb combination prevention interventions and treatment in a very simple to use guide. And it has a very good reference list where you can get other tools that you may require. 
But why I've chosen it as well is because it's framed in quite a nice approach. They have five modules, and one of them is this core component of community mobilization. And I think this policy discussion comes at a really important time, because yesterday we heard this concept of powerless to powerful, and how community involvement is really essential part of an effective response. And this guideline, which reflects global best practice and global evidence, puts this first. It also highlights the importance of legal reform, which is why decriminalization is essential, and also the role that stigma and discrimination play in not only contributing to, to the harms, but actually preventing us from making people's lives better. It also then goes into detail about the different service packages and ways to provide them and provide some useful tips around program management. So what I've decided to do is just as a kind of an introduction to the session that will follow, to focus on what's happening around community mobilization, legal reform, policy process and services in South Africa. And some of it is a recap of what other people have alluded to, but this is just to contextualize it ahead of the policy discussion. So encouragingly, there are small movements of people who use drugs in South Africa. They've oftentimes started as the planning phases of harm reduction programs. They have been envisioned as part of community advisory groups that inform program development, but also have been a mechanism to provide group level interventions. They've since then evolved into many other more exciting things. And these exist in Cape Town, Durban, Pretoria, and most recently have been established in Port Elizabeth. There is a nascent and growing network of people who use drugs. The first was, was established in Gauteng, which is one of South Africa's um, most economic or important provinces. That's where Johannesburg and Chwane or Pretoria are. And the most recent city was uh, the drug users of Cape Town. And these are coming together to form the South African network of people who use drugs, which will then be affiliated to INPUD, which is the international network of people who use drugs. So that's a very encouraging um, element. And through funding through Mainline and INPUD, there's capacity development in building action researchers, advocates, and service providers from the community of people who use drugs, including people who inject drugs. And as you heard yesterday from Nelson, there's an increasing move of shifting service delivery to people who use drugs themselves, or people who have links to the community of people who use drugs. So it's a very important time. Now, it's important to note that drug use remains illegal in South Africa. And our criminal justice system, having heard earlier, is based on a, a metric of arrest statistics, which is extremely problematic. And there's a societal expectation for increased arrests of people who use drugs. And there's about a 24% increase expected in arrests this year. That's the South African police's performance target. So we have to contextualize that of what's expected of the police to do in response to what communities, the broader community, not the people who inject drugs, expect of the police. So as a result of this, we have high levels of human rights violations, and please read the report that will be launched tomorrow, documenting some of these. We have significant barriers to harm reduction interventions. Colleagues in Pretoria have been arrested. Some of them have been kept overnight because of distributing evidence-based recommended interventions to prevent HIV and hepatitis. And this contributes to wide-ranging stigma and discrimination. Encouragingly, there have been some policy discussions with police, particularly in Durban, and I've been very fortunate to be involved in those. And there have been interesting spaces to enable some police to engage with prosecuting authority and academics and service providers to reflect a little bit on what they've been doing and ways forward. There have also been local level engagement with police stations that the organizations involved in harm reduction have done as part of their planning, but also in reaction to some of the negative consequences of community perception of service delivery and also of um, pressure on the police to, to perform. There's also an interesting initiative being done by the South African police, and there's some people from the D Division of Employer Health and Wellness that are here that are part of this groundbreaking initiative that is looking to train police around understanding the engagement between key populations, so that's LGBTI community, people who use drugs and sex workers, and police, in the existing legal environment. And that is currently being piloted and will be rolled out. There's also been encouraging steps towards inclusion of people who use drugs in policy process. However, it has been flawed. For example, the South African Global Fund concept note developed included people who use drugs, 
but often the recommendations that came out of that process were not included in the near final draft of the National AIDS um, strategy. Similarly, the, uh, sorry, the Global Fund concept note, there was a lot of additional advocacy that needed to happen. Similarly, with the National Strategic Plan, there were a range of community consultations with, with key populations, but very few of those recommendations actually made it through to the final document. So those processes are in place, but it's important to note that key decision makers very high up are vetoing those positions. In terms of legal reform rights and stigma discrimination, there have been policy processes, and this is probably the, the most significant one, but I remember meeting people from IDPC, uh, COACT, and uh, West African colleagues at an ACASA conference a few years ago, talking around HIV and drug use uh, in Africa, and at that stage, we hadn't started any harm reduction services in South Africa, and it's great for us to reflect in the, the wonderful things that have happened. And then, ahead of the South African AIDS Council, there was a, there was a conference in 2015, there was a pre-conference around drug use and HIV. There are problems with the policy process. As mentioned, the South African National Drug Master Plan historically has try to be consultative and speak to communities, but it has historically excluded almost completely people who use drugs. At some times it has included people who have recovered from drugs, but almost exclusively limited representation and voice to organizations that have an abstinence-only based approach, which is extremely problematic. The National Drug Authority and the, the Substance Abuse Forums similarly replicate that, that there's no place for organizations who talk around the rights of people who want to continue using drugs or people who are still using drugs or who are promoting harm reduction interventions. However, that encouragingly is changing a little bit. And this, encouragingly, the National Drug Master Plan for the first time has taken a particular effort to hear the stories of people who use drugs and that report, or at least a draft report, will be launched, and that's an encouraging move forward. In terms of HIV platforms, similar problem. There's no sector within the South African National AIDS Council that appropriately, appropriately focuses on the issues affecting people who use drugs. There is an LGBTI sector, there is a sex work sector, and drug use is cross-cutting, but it definitely doesn't get the level of appreciation that is required. And there's almost no representation on provincial AIDS councils or on local district AIDS councils advocating for the rights of people who use drugs, not people who promote abstinence-only approaches. I think their voice is often heard. Similarly, from the medical perspective, those people that are turned to for advice are often morally based and not founded in evidence. And that is very problematic when the Central Drug Authority and others have nowhere else to go to and they go to voices that are not representing all medical professions. So there's no position from the South African Medical Association or of the Southern African HIV Clinician Society supporting harm reduction, and that is extremely problematic. Similarly for the nursing councils. So this is what's happening with health service delivery more broadly. It's important to note that in most places, the service providers of harm reduction are civil society organizations. There is government support and in some places some government financing, but it is being delivered by civil society organizations. I've excluded private service providers here because I think they provide an important role, but they often provide services for the people who aren't particularly vulnerable. They provide for pe services for people who can afford treatment or afford to pay for services. So you'll see Gauteng is the center where there are the city of Chwani, the city of Johannesburg, and Ekuhuleni. The activities in brackets are interventions that are imminent or planned. So you'll see there are small needle syringe programs, opioid substitution therapy programs, drop-in centers, and HIV testing at TB screening in most places. And there is limited availability of overdose prevention, but it's largely only among the medical trained people and some peers. And there is no hepatitis treatment except for Cape Town, and it's very limited to the University of Cape Town's liver clinic. And you will see that most of the metropolitans have something, but there's nothing in the interior. So in terms of policy gaps, I think decriminalization of drug use is essential. And perhaps as a later stage, looking at seeing yesterday's um, presentation by Prof. Nutt,
There may be alternative uh, views of policy to have the big best outcome, but decriminalization and not criminalizing people who use drugs or in possession of drugs really needs to happen urgently. I think we have a policy opportunity to increase policy for widespread coverage of the comprehensive package of interventions, which include needle syringe programs and opioid substitution therapy. But importantly, we need to now recommend the provision of safe injecting spaces and safe drug so consumption rooms because it's part of evidence-based recommendation. We also should be providing explicit policy for and provision of services people who enter into the criminal justice service, and that's currently not being done at all. And we really need to step up to the African and global commitment to end viral hepatitis by 2030. Thank you very much.